Welcome to the online video on the potentiometric titration of iron 2. Let's get started. Potentiometry is an analytical method in which an electric potential difference or a voltage of a cell is measured. In your experiment you will measure the voltage of an electrochemical cell using an oxidation reduction potential sensor made by Vernier. Vernier's ORP sensor is composed of a measuring half cell and a reference half cell. The measuring half cell is made of platinum and is also called the metallic indicator electrode. The reference half cell is the is the silver silver chloride electrode. In this experiment you will determine the molar concentration of an unknown solution containing iron 2. The voltage potential for the electrochemical cell can be deduced from the Nernst equation shown here. If you recall, the Nernst equation correlates the voltage potential with the relative concentrations of reduced and oxidized species in the reaction. The reaction that you will investigate involves iron 2 plus cerium 4 reacting to give iron 3 and cerium 3. In any potentiometric titration you should consider two questions which species is oxidized and which species is reduced. Here iron 2 is acting as the reducing agent and cerium 4 is acting as the oxidizing agent. Since cerium 4 is going to serve as our titrant we are going to focus more on it serving as the oxidizing agent in this reaction. It's also important to consider relevant half reactions such as those shown here. Now let's examine what a potentiometric titration curve looks like. In a potentiometric titration, titration curve you're going to graph the electrochemical potential on the y-axis and the volume of titrant on the x-axis. This example is from figure 16.2 in your text. It's important to notice the S-shape of this curve. Here the equivalence point is at the inflection point of the curve because the example depicts a one-to-one -one molar stoichiometry between the oxidized and the reduced species. However, not all titration curves will give such a sharp transition as depicted here. That's why we recommend also calculating and graphing the first derivative of the voltage potential to help you identify the equivalence point. Now let's talk about what happens at all three regions of the titration curve, before, after, and at the equivalence point. Prior to the equivalence point, the electrochemical cell potential is a function of the relative concentrations of iron 2 and iron 3 in solution. Remember cerium 4 is acting as the titrant. As you add cerium 4 to your reaction mix that contains the iron 2 unknown, some of the iron 2 will react with cerium 4 to produce the products iron 3 and cerium 3 but some of the iron 2 will remain unreacted. So to determine the concentrations of the different species that are relevant prior to the equivalence point, iron 3 plus is going to be equivalent to the number of moles of cerium 4 added divided by the total volume in the beaker, while iron 2 is going to be a little more complex. It's going to be equal to the, no, the original number of moles of iron 2 that you started with minus those moles that reacted, namely the moles of cerium 4 that you added, divided by the total volume in the beaker. After the equivalence point, the electrochemical cell potential is a function of the relative concentrations of cerium 3 and cerium 4 in solution. After the equivalence point, the <clears throat> there is sufficient cerium-4 in excess uh, to oxidize all of the iron-2 that's in the beaker. So here, iron-2 is limiting. So after the equivalence point, 
all of the iron 2 available is going to react to give with, with cerium 4 to give you iron 3 and cerium 3. So the concentrations of cerium 3 is going to be equivalent to that of, of iron 2. But the excess cerium 4 is what you have to deduce now. So cerium 3 is going to be equal to the number of moles of iron 2 added divided by the total volume in the beaker. But the concentration of cerium 4 is going to be the total number of moles of cerium 4 added minus those moles that reacted with iron 2, namely the original number of moles of iron 2 divided by the total volume in the beaker. At the equivalence point, the number of moles of iron 2 and the moles of, of cerium 4 are equivalent. Therefore, the concentration of iron 2 is equal to the number of moles of cerium 4 that you added divided, divided by the volume of iron 2 that you put into the beaker. So this is the essential question of the whole lab. What is the concentration of iron 2 in your unknown? So you can figure it out by identifying the molar concentration of cerium 4 which you will know exactly from the prep that you'll do because you'll prepare that sample by weighing out a specific amount and dissolving it uh, quantitatively into a specific volume. So you'll know that molar concentration from your prep. You'll know the volume of cerium-4 from the titration because that's your titrant. When you multiply molarity times volume that gives you moles and the, that's equivalent this in here in this equation that's equivalent to the number of moles of iron 2 that you have in the beaker and you'll divide that by the volume of the unknown that you put in the beaker and that's how you'll determine the molar concentration of iron 2 in your unknown figure 16 1 in your text depicts our experimental design except the iron 2 in the unknown is going to be prepared in water but you are going to be instructed to add several mils of sulfuric acid to prevent hydrolysis side reactions from occurring. Your raw data may look like the blue curve shown in this slide. Since the inflection point is not very steep, graphing the first derivative, which here is shown in red, will help you to pinpoint the equivalence point more precisely. Some of the chemicals in this potentiometric titration of iron 2 are very dangerous, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about safety before we wrap up. As you know, sulfuric acid is a very strong acid. We've talked about this before. It can cause burns, and it's definitely something that you don't want to breathe, and you don't want to come in contact with your skin. You're going to be using a concentrated sulfuric acid uh, solution as well as the a more dilute two molar sample so you need to exercise caution when using both of those uh, sulfuric acid samples if you happen to get any of the reaction mix containing sulfuric acid or any of the the stock sulfuric acid on your skin make sure you rinse the affected area immediately with water for at least 15 minutes The oxidizing agent in this experiment is ceric ammonium nitrate and it is a very strong oxidizer. In general, you always want to use caution when working with oxidizers because of their propensity to react with lots of different chemicals. In this particular case, um, ceric ammonium nitrate can also intensify fires. So even though it's not flammable in and of itself, it has a GSH a symbol that indicates to you that you have to be careful because of its propensity to intensify fires. It can also be corrosive to metals and cause severe burns and may even cause allergic skin reactions. In terms of its reactivity, I should point out that ceric ammonium nitrate can react with acids, which you're going to do in this experiment. But at high enough concentrations it can do so very violently to the point of forming an explosion. 
So because we're going to have more dilute samples of ceric ammonium nitrate and sulfuric acid, you don't need to worry about the possibility of an explosion, but you should still be very, very careful when working with these chemicals. Finally, you're going to be working with ferrous ammonium sulfate as your unknown. And ferrous ammonium sulfate is dangerous because it can cause skin irritations and even very serious eye irritations. It may even cause respiratory irritations. So you want to exercise caution when working with this chemical. In summary, please make sure that you wear your proper PPE. You need to make sure that you're wearing your laboratory coat, your safety glasses at all times in the lab, and nitrile gloves to protect your hands while working in the lab. Please work wisely, especially with respect to discarding waste so that we don't have an overflow of the waste in the hood. This concludes my video lecture and I thank you very much for your attention.